What's going on guys? Brandon Charleston here with another tutorial. It's been a while since I've published a video, you know, deep at work with clients and things like that, which is all fun and dandy. But I'm going to be posting a lot more content on the regular basis just so I can share my findings and knowledge um, for things that I learn. So that way I can hopefully uh, teach you guys uh, practical scenarios and real use cases around building systems with businesses so you can raise your top line. So. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can leverage N8N and actually add memory for it, real-time memory that is, like cache memory. And we're gonna go over a few things about how to set it up, why it's, it's set up that way, at least my understanding about it, and then some practical use cases around why it might be relevant for you guys and how that might be beneficial, especially for free, right? There's no cost, anything like that. So typically when we work with clients, there's gonna be a need or some sort of use case where we run into some sort of scenario or a service, especially with N8N, where you're stitching together you know, tons of different services and APIs. And N8N is a beautiful platform where you can actually add things like Redis, for example, uh, which we're gonna go over, and uh, how easy it is, at least uh, from my understanding, and getting it to work. Uh, and why it would be actually probably something that you might need too. So anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. Firstly, if you're not already familiar with N8N, uh, it's definitely one of my favorite platforms along with Clay. Uh, they have an open source community edition, so you can get started right away by simply cloning the repo and put it either on your computer or put it on a DigitalOcean droplet or any sort of other uh, hosting platform where you can basically access it from the internet. And so that's one thing that we do. We typically like to set up instances where it's contained for the company. That way their data is secure. We can really control a lot of the workflows and everything right on prem. And so they can uh, really scale their operations, right? So that's about any Dan. Definitely encourage you to check it out and uh, get started there, right? Uh, and then from here, there's another service called Redis. I'm fairly new to it, but uh, after my research, I'm um, I feel ready and dangerous about it, especially getting it to work. And you can kind of think of Redis as real-time caching, uh, almost like a computer where you have RAM, uh, where you need to instantaneously access some data, right? There might be scenarios where you are building out a database, uh, like Supabase or anything like that, and there might be quick ship ways, uh, which is certainly quick, um, but it's not always secure. And I'm talking about using like Google Sheets and things like that, where you might store a link or an API key or really just sensitive data uh, where it's not really the best to actually store it actually on a Google Sheet. And that's very easy for just to create a sheet, you know, you update the link or anything like that. And it's just not long term a best case scenario because anybody can access it at least that's in the um, you know the workspace, and to me it's not the best practical scenario. And so Redis is definitely uh, a great start, and uh, it's actually pretty simple to get it started. And so in my opinion, you're basically giving your N8N instance uh, a memory bank, um, and it could be as large as as you need. At least from my experience here, uh, where there there are some people and some videos that I saw, apparently they're using it for their database. So as long as you can outline the schema, obviously you want to consider your use case on whether you want to store data uh, on Redis uh, for real time, or if you want to store it in like a super base and things like that. Another use case that I saw was uh, for like dashboards or anything where you know it takes like a load time um, anywhere where it's just like. You know those days when you bring up a website or it's just kind of loading and you're like why is this taking forever right well this is probably going to be a good option for you uh, to basically transfer the data and cache it or put it on cache similar to like i mentioned which is using like your hard drive on your computer or accessing the information from ram so that way the application will move a lot faster and the use case we're going to be using is uh, for a client of mine and it's not Bizabo, but they use Bizabo. And uh, it's basically for events and booking events. And the use case here is it's very tedious to do checks, especially if it's a private event where we're trying to, you know, basically make sure that they're eligible and then we want to actually book the ticket and uh, and move forward with the workflow, right? And it was brought up to me about how can we automate this because there's some checks and things like that where we can cross-reference 
uh, the list for Google Sheets. And then basically if it's on the eligibility list, we'll just send it to Bizabo through their API and we'll book the ticket, right? And uh, with that, they have their uh, you know lovely API docs. And what you'll find in API docs is a lot of things. <laughs> um, and a lot of them I find actually sometimes are inaccurate or not up to date. So you definitely won't, there's gonna be some friction points sometimes depending on what software you are using. But uh, the thing here is sometimes with APIs, a lot of times you will send the request through their endpoint. So you'll have all these different endpoints, right? It's basically like a, pretty much like a tool or a, a one scenario where you either get information or you're posting or putting information into the system and accessing on the back end. Uh, that's the most common methods anyway. You're either getting something or posting something. And with um, Visibo, their, their method for accessing information is through OAuth 2.0. And so the difference here is I can't just simply make an API key and then send a request, right, uh, with an API key because that's generally very common uh, when you're using platforms uh, that I talk about on my channel all the time. But sometimes you have to actually authenticate a credential where that one credential is going to create another credential for like 24 hours or something. You're basically getting an access token for 24 hours. Well, it's not always best for something like clay or even any end where every single time that you're making that request uh, to that service that you're generating a new token right you want to use the current token for the 24-hour period in order to get your information and so i set up a workflow and then another workflow just to create the token and then we're using redis to store that token and then every 24 hours it's going to refresh that and store it to memory so that way in the other workflow I can pull that token and we're always just good cycle so that way we're not pinging the crap out of Visibo service right and so as I mentioned uh, this is a clay instance uh, that we have for our client and this is a registration um, table and so what we do is we just pull the list and then we simply upload this list and then each row which is great with clay each row can make an API request we are sending this over to N8N. So it's a little bit different of a use case than what we typically do with Clay, but Clay is a great platform for this for, to be able to send you know, large amounts of rows. I know, uh, well, 271 for now, but uh, it's a pretty large event. And so I imagine we'll be uploading this, we'll dedupe, and then from there, it's gonna send it to N8N where each row is going to check the eligibility list. And then if they are, it's going to send a Bizabo registration. And you'll see, uh, pretty simple, we're just doing a check on the email. And so you just put proper JSON on there and then you send it off, right? And then what we're doing here is, this is N8M and what we're doing is this is a Bizabo token refresh. And so I have scheduled this for every 20 hours because why not, right? Why, why push to the 24? So we're doing it every 20 hours where it is simply a, a scheduled trigger will trigger off. And then we're making a post request to simply generate a JWT token or an OAuth token. And then we're gonna store that, we're gonna pull that the response is going to be that new token and then we're just going to store that to redis um, and it'll be accessible right and then in the next workflow here very simple we're talking five nodes so far i'm still building this out but essentially we're going to catch the webhook from clay so over in clay we are sending it to the endpoint that is there it's going to catch the information which is the email address we're gonna do a quick lookup of Google Sheets and we're gonna see if that email exists. And if that email exists, then it's gonna send, a re it's gonna get the token that we stored on Redis, the memory. And then we're gonna take that token and make the create ticket uh, endpoint to Bizabo with the client account. And then we're good to go. And then sequentially, they're gonna get like a Slack notification, obviously, and so going from there. But this is a good demonstration of how we can actually have on memory, um, you know, with the N8N instance and not have to store this on a Google Sheets or anything like that. And it just makes things a lot more neat and tidy, right, uh, for production use. And so really uh, what we could do, all you need to do is um, 
go into N8N, and then we are simply going to go into launch the droplet console, uh, which I've previously done already. And you're just going to simply go into there. And then we just need to add, um, well, Redis really, but we're going to need to make some modifications to our docker compose.yml file, which I'll go over here in a second. And then we're going to need to create a folder or basically a volume uh, into our Docker container. Uh, so that way we can uh, have that created. And then when we reboot it, it's actually gonna be on the Docker hub. So it basically pulls it already, about 40 megabytes if I remember right. So it's not a whole lot of uh, data. And then from there, stick with me here. When you install N8N on a Docker container, so a Docker container is pretty much a box software. It is isolated from its environment. You can think of it like a room in a house where it's still part of the house, but there's walls and what happens in that room more or less won't affect the entire house, right? So uh, let's say you're in the kitchen and you're making some bacon and that kitchen is nice and sealed that you sh the next door you know room shouldn't smell bacon but bacon's pretty strong so but i think you get what i'm talking about so um it's basically a box container and so what we're going to do is we want to i'm going to hit ls just to see what i'm looking at what i'm looking at and then i'm going to hit cd n8n docker caddy and then we're going to hit ls to list out and then what I want to do is to go into docker compose.yml and we're going to hit nano docker compose.yml. And you will see here we have all the services, right? And I purposely did not set my password yet just so I can demonstrate this before I make the password. Um, however, you're going to have a lot of information already in here. Uh, that's by default when you clone the repo. And so you're going to have basically services. Uh, and then in those services, you, you want to pay particular attention to the indentation. So these ones have two spaces. You see that before we actually make it. And then this one is indented a little bit more. Pay particular close to the indentation. And sometimes you're going to need to call the consultants, i.e. chat GPT or Claude and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, use AI to help you know work through uh, the friction points if you can't quite pinpoint you know where is the curly brace here or what am I missing right uh, there's no no reason to overthink things when we have great tools like ChatGPT now what you're going to want to do is modify your YML file now when you have the N8N Docker container if you put this on your computer you can just clone the repo and it's a Docker container, right? It's not, it's on your computer and it's not on the internet. When you have it on a Docker container, or excuse me, a digital ocean droplet, and it's on the internet or on the cloud, you need to have a caddy attached to it. And so basically think of a caddy as like your door guard. Um, so it allows you to access HTTP and HTTPS. So that way you can actually throw webhooks at it, you can make calls, it's officially on the cloud. And like I said, it's like your front door or your security guard uh, to accessing the world uh, of your house, right? Um, that's what you're creating there. <clears throat> and so you're gonna have two things, you're gonna have caddy and then N8N. And in the box, you don't really need to do a whole lot because at the start, when you actually set up your N8N instance, caddy and N8N, you don't need to do anything. It just works once you get set it up right, ideally, right? But when you add another service like Redis or any other service, you actually need to create a network, a bridge network within those, at least from my experience here. And you'll see here, it says networks, and then we're simply adding these lines. You just type them in, but make sure that it's indented properly, right? Uh, because it calls out the hierarchy there. And then the same thing here, you're gonna see down where I also added networks, which is N8N network, okay? So I've put the caddy, the N8N services, because this is under services. We have caddy, N8N, and I'm putting them on an N8N network inside my Docker container. So that way, bear with me here, think of it like they're in a house and N8N and caddy be like, cool, like we can talk to each other, right? But when you bring in another guy, or gal, like Redis, that is a completely separate dude or gal in your house now. And they don't know 
what you're talking to or what's going on. N8N can actually talk to Redis without a bridge network. And that's why we want to add this. So we're going to add the service. <clears throat> and then when you uh, reboot Docker Compose down and Docker Compose up dash D, which we'll do here in a second, um, you're going to see that it's actually going to register it. And then it's going to basically pull Redis from the Docker hub and you're going to be good to go. Now, when you go into here, just make sure you leave this, require password, and then you're gonna to wanna to use, a, create a secure password and then store that securely uh, in from there. Now you'll notice I also put network here, again, any in network. And then you wanna put volumes. Uh, so I'm making it recognize volumes, which we'll create here in a second, but I'm referencing the volume here. And then you can see the networks. I'm taking the networks and then the driver is bridge. Um, uh, that's as far as I go with that one. It just works. So take it for what it is, and it's just what it is. It works, right? Why, uh, why say anymore? So we're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna send my password later, but I'm gonna hit Control X to leave. If you've made changes, it's gonna prompt you to save changes, and therefore you want to hit Y and then Enter. And then all we got to do is hit Docker Compose down and and Docker Compose up dash D, and it's gonna basically reboot. And you can see here, we've already done that. Now I did miss one step um, and that's essentially, you're gonna want to, before, so you go into your YML file, make your changes there, make sure that you, you validate you know, everything in there, put in a chat GPT, make sure it's, you didn't miss anything. And then what you're gonna wanna do is uh, create the volume. So we're gonna hit Docker, volume, create, and then we're gonna do Redis data. And I would hit enter, but I already did it. Basically, it's just going to create the volume uh, on your Docker container. So that's that. And then, then you want to do Docker Compose Down and Docker Compose Up dash D. And uh, that's pretty much it. And so when you go into Redis, you're going to want to, um, you know, you can just do Redis and then you'll see Redis right here. And you have a number of actions and even triggers on your Redis event. There's a number of uh, things you can um, you can do. And so all we did was we did set key on this one, set the value of key. <clears throat> now I would check the documents on uh, setting the proper schema and things like that because you can, uh, your data is how you structure it, right? So there's no need to go there. Um, but essentially we're, gonna, we're just gonna try this and then we're gonna hit pen. And then you'll see that you're gonna have your password and then we have user your host is going to be Redis. A lot of this stuff is going to be pre-populated already. So it's pretty, pretty simple. And if your Redis is already running, just hit connection and you're going to be good to go. So this is standard. You put in your password and all good to go there. So that is that on Redis. So uh, with that said, yeah, you got yourself some memory, some free. So your any den can remember things on the Docker container. And I uh, hope this was useful for you guys. Please like and subscribe, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.